pens of black Americans have been used in the fight to gain recognition of our equality. Poets, novelists, playwrights, all have written eloquently and passionately. In doing so, they have created great literature as well as persuasive arguments. These writings have become part of the American scene and part of the literary heritage of all Americans. One of the foremost sports in America is actor-writer Roscoe Lee Brown. The pen is mightier than the sword. Now, surely you've heard that quotation before, but perhaps you never really thought a lot about what it means. And as has been said before, the greatest eloquence and the most persuasive words are frequently provoked by anger, oppression, and anguish. Small wonder, then, that black writers have made some of the most important contributions to contemporary American literature. Each had something important to say, and each found an indelible way to say it. One of the monumental figures in contemporary American literature was a Joplin, Missouri man named Langston Hughes. Hughes was a poet and a novelist and the winner of many prizes and much acclaim. But he will be best remembered as the man who took the frustration and the humor, the anguish and the joy, indeed the actual life of the poor, and made their voices heard throughout the world. He made moving poetry out of the language of the streets. Listen to a bit of Lenox Avenue mural, a word picture of New York's Harlem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Another contemporary writer is Margaret Walker, the daughter of an Alabama minister. She often said that she believed that a good sermon was like poetry, and that poetry was like a good sermon. Margaret Walker is a prize-winning novelist and poet. The words that follow are from her famous poem, For My People. For my people, lending their strength to the years, to the gone years, and the now years, and the maybe years, washing, ironing, cooking, scrubbing, sewing, mending, hoeing, plowing, digging, planting, pruning, patching, dragging along, never gaining, never reaping, never knowing, and never understanding. For the cramped, bewildered years we went to school to learn to know the reasons why and the answers to and the people who and the places where and the days when in memory of the bitter hours when we discovered we were black and poor and small and different and nobody cared and nobody wondered and nobody understood. For my people thronging 47th Street in Chicago and Lenox Avenue in New York and Rampart Street in New Orleans, lost, disinherited, dispossessed, and happy people, filling the cabarets and taverns and other people's pockets, needing bread and shoes and milk and land and money and something, something all our own. Many eloquent people have brought attention to the black experience, unique among them, is this writer of essays, novels, and plays, James Baldwin. It is said that in his work, the English language sings again. Recently, the noted actor Brock Peters asked James Baldwin what it took to be a writer. It's a hard question to answer, you know, because it's both simple and very complex. I was born in the church, my father was a preacher. I was a preacher for a while. Uh, I was saved, as they say. But I learned something in it 
about other human beings. I learned something you needed about myself. Maybe I can say, but I'm telescoping it, that the effort to be a writer is an act of love. It's an act of faith. Brock asked Mr. Baldwin what impact he thought was made on black culture by the fact that, until rather recently, the tradition was largely oral in nature. We, if I may say so, I think that we are, the black people of this country, are extraordinary in that we are the product of a history which was not written down, no, which was handed down from mother to daughter, from father to son. And the vehicle of that is the church. The church was the only institution where a black man is free. From Africa to Mississippi to Chicago is quite a journey. And what happened to my father was he never understood, how could he, that we hit the streets. We had to hit the streets. That's where our challenges were. And we did not remember the landscape, which he remembered, you know. And one of the reasons he went mad was because he lost his children in the streets of New York. In recent years, the American stage has been enriched by a number of vital plays from the pens of black playwrights. Amen Corner by James Baldwin, Ossie Davis's Pearly Victorious, The Dutchman by Leroy Jones, and perhaps the most universal of all, Lorraine Hansberry's touching Raisin in the Sun. In this key scene, we see Mama, a strong Southern matriarch, struggling to understand her son's changing values now that they live in a hostile northern city. So, how come you talk so much about money? Because it's life, Mama. Money is life? Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, freedom used to be life. Now it's money. I guess the world really do change. No, Mama, it's always been money. We just didn't know about it. No, no. Something has changed. You something new, boy. In my day, we was worried about not being lynched and how to make it to the North if we could. Or how just to stay alive and have a pinch of dignity, too. But now here come you and Benita talking about things we ain't never even thought about, hardly me and your daddy. You ain't satisfied or proud of nothing we done. I mean that you had a home. We kept you out of trouble till you was grown. And you ain't never had to ride to work on the back of nobody's streetcar. You're my children. But how different we done to come. You don't understand, Mama. Mama, you just don't understand. Before the play ends, Walter Lee gets into deep trouble. And then he... Why don't you look up the play, Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry, and collect your friends and read all the parts aloud. You'll enjoy it. It'd be fun. Oh, there's something else I wanted to say to you, and that is that perhaps everything we've been speaking about involves freedom. Now, black writers write on the same subjects that all writers write on. However, the insistent beat in all black poetry and or literature of all kinds is the presence of the absence of freedom. Let me illustrate with a poem that captures, I think, the essence of what we've been saying. It is a poem by that prize-winning, distinguished poet Gwendolyn Brooks. And she calls it Paul Robeson. And if you'll forgive me, I'll wear my glasses to read it to you. At that time, we all heard it, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day. The major voice the adult voice, foregoing rolling river, foregoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond, warning in music words, devout 
and large, that we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's magnitude and bond. Oh, the power that is in words. It's mighty, stronger than physical force, stronger than money, because once you put words into a person's mind, nothing can remove them. And that is why, to black America still struggling for true equality, words that sing out are still such a vital part of the struggle. 